Hello, I'm Paquita Davis Friday, Interim Dean at the Zicklin School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Zicklin Talks Business. Today's topic is corporate tax morality. We welcome Michael Meisler, a tax faculty member at the Zicklin School of Business, and Daniel Halperin, a professor emeritus from Harvard Law, and also a graduate of our undergraduate program. Leading the conversation is Larry Zicklin, former chairman of Neuberger Berman and alum. I'm also very proud to say that Larry teaches our future business leaders at Baruch. Without further ado, here's Larry. Thank you very much and uh, welcome Mike, Michael and Dan. Uh, Michael and I have recently met, uh, but Dan and I were classmates at Baruch. And as he reminded me, we've been good friends for 68 years since our, our meeting at Baruch in our freshman year. One of the risks of a conversation like this is getting deep into a rabbit hole. So we're going to work very hard on making sure we don't get there. Um, we're dedicated to making sure that that doesn't happen. So let's begin with the business at hand. Dan, I'm, I'm going to ask you as, as the lawyer and Michael as the lawyer in the group, do individuals or corporations have any obligation to pay what the government meant them to pay when the tax laws were written, in other words, com uh, complying with both the letter and the spirit of the law, or is there obligation to shareholders simply to avoid uh, as many taxes as possible, seeking any legal loophole available? So I'll start with you, Danny, on that. Well, I think I think it's a it's a complicated question. Uh, I think what we can do is try to modify the law or modify the understanding of the law. So people have a greater incentive to pay what the law requires. Uh, the taxpayers certainly vary in the, their degree of aggression in, in taking positions. Uh, the position I think we would want people to take is to take the position that their, the law expects them to take, the, the amount that they're supposed to be paying. Most people certainly believe that if you have a reasonable basis for your position, which would mean that if the IRS happens to audit you and challenge it, the only thing you would owe is interest, uh, which would now be uh, somewhere between six and 8%, uh, which is not startling. Uh, and therefore people are willing to do that on the risk that they won't be audited or all they will owe is interest. Uh, I think the, the law should require people to determine reasonable basis by looking at the spirit of the law or the meaning of the law or the intent of the law some people believe that you can just look at language and they also at least believe that you can try to, I don't know, work the language to come up with a meet that fits your case, even though that's certainly not the natural meeting. Uh, I think some people would go further and say that uh, I'm going to risk audit. I'm going to, I'm going to do anything I can that at least I can claim is not fraud. Uh, and uh, I'm like, the chances of audit are small. So I, I think that uh, what we would need to do is one, increase the chances of audit, which presumably Congress did in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, though uh, the speaker, possibly future Speaker McCarthy says as soon as he's in charge, he's gonna repeal that. So there seems to be a belief in the Republican party that we don't want people to pay what they owe. Uh, we certainly, we don't want the IRS to be checking them. We could check, we could change that and we could try to make it clear that you don't have a reasonable basis for the position if you ignore the intent of the law and the spirit of the law. And, and, and what happens if, you, if it's determined that you don't have a reasonable position? What's the penalty there? Well, you would, you would have a 20%, I think it's a 20% penalty of, of the amount of tax that you owe. And that would be a lot more serious, plus the interest. So that would be a lot more serious. Got it. Michael? Well, in the case of fraud, it could be as high as 75%. And if it's criminal, you know, then, then the IRS certainly has, you know, other, other sticks that it can hit taxpayers with. Uh, I, I would start the answer to the question by quoting the Supreme Court. Uh, many, many decades ago, uh, the Supreme Court said about paying taxes that taxpayers have an obligation to pay their fair share, but not more than that. And what's fair is in the eye of the beholder. And that, and that, that gets... The general quote, I didn't quote that verbatim, but that general quote gets used a lot in big tax cases. Um, I, in this, you know, we've had some prep and conversation and preparing for today. And I, I've consistently said, you know, the, 
the notion of corporate morality in this context is really hard line for those that are, you know, tax directors at large companies, they have an obligation to shareholders, they have a duty to minimize the taxes, the taxes to the extent that they can legally. Uh, that's their charge. And, uh, and I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think the obligation is just to pay what they owe, and to use legal methods available to them uh, to minimize those taxes where they're allowed to do so. Isn't it very difficult, though, to define what it is you owe? There's a whole legislative history, there's legislative intent. Um, it isn't a finite number that we can all agree upon. It Agreed. depends how you look at the problem, I guess. Agreed. And how, how big you think the problem is. Um, but, you know, you know, it, I, I tend to think that uh, at least the uh, most experienced tax lawyers know the answer to that question more often than not. Uh, what they don't know is what they can get away with. That's, I, that's, I, that's I, I would answer. say this. I would say this, Larry, the you know, the stuff that you just can do and it's clear is very clear. The stuff you can't do is generally very clear. And it's it's the gray. It's where there's a lack of guidance or the guidance is a little wishy washy where you know a lot of tax lawyers get paid a lot of money to parse those words and try to figure out you know what is the limit of what those words mean and uh, you know and there's also a sometimes a race to someone taking advantage of a loophole the way that a law is written and then it may take a few years for congress to catch up to that or the irs to catch up to that and do lawyers and accountants when they're in these questionable uh, moments. Do lawyers and accountants look back at the legislative history to see what was the intent of the legislation? Certainly. Uh, you know, you, you have the Supreme Court, and particularly Justice Scalia, who says that's irrelevant. You have to only look at the language of the code. Uh, and uh, that, that really troubles me. I spent seven years in Treasury trying to write this law. And uh, it is an the hardest thing I've ever done in my life by a factor of three or four. And anybody who says that the failure to get it clear if Congress should fix it is just wrong. I mean, it's much more, it's much better to look at what they were trying to do and not try to pass parse word for word because that is just an impossible standard. Right. And and I can tell you, Larry, up until up until last year, I was, you know, in practice and representing clients uh, for most of my career. And I had the opportunity to work through various financial products and instruments that came out over the decades that had no guidance to them and tried to figure out how to apply the laws that existed. And we often look to legislative history to try to parse through how to advise in the absence of any clear guidance. And, and to what degree do you consider the stakeholders around the law and the reputation of the corporations if it is determined that they have to go to tax court or there's publicity uh, in the media, one part of the media or another, is that a consideration when you make this determination of what you're going to pay? It, it is. It was for me. Um, I, I can say that I, I am a conservative person by nature. And, uh, you know, but it's never my, it was never my job to impose my judgment onto the client, merely to let them know of the risks and let them apply their business judgment to it. But as a general rule for most of my clients throughout my career, I would say that if the end of the story was you have to go to tax court and hope you win in tax court, that was a losing proposition and most of my clients would not take that position. Because of the expense of going to court, because of the reputational risk, because of the risk of loss and, and, and really Wall Street Journal risk along with that. And how much? Oh, uh, sure. Sorry about that. How much responsibility do prepare, preparers, advisors, consultants have in this process, or is it all the role of the taxpayer, and the taxpayer is responsible, and consultants and advisors have no responsibility? Well, yeah. I think you know, your clients want to hear from you. They want to know what their chances are of 
of uh, establishing a winning position, what their chances of losing if they're audited, what's their chances in the tax court. And, you know, many people might feel like Michael feels. They, they don't want the hassle of, of a case. Uh, I worked with uh, some lawyers when I was in practice uh, back in the 60s who took very aggressive positions. And I had the sense that their clients weren't really aware of how aggressive these positions were. Uh, and 99% of the time, nobody ever found out it was an aggressive position. A uh, couple of people I know were mad, but maybe they thought that was the best way to do it. But uh, whether that works, and it doesn't seem to me that's the best way to practice. Actually, if, if I can if I can chime in here, we do have an audience question. Uh, this is from Michael Meisler. Did you ever have a client who didn't take your advice and ended up in tax court? And how did that go? Uh, I had a few clients that didn't take my advice. Um, I both large and small. I had a non-public company where they didn't take our advice, and uh, it ultimately for a host of reasons, the company, not just because of taxes, but took that approach to lots of things that they did. Uh, they ended up going public and bankrupt within about a six week stretch, about two years after we left them as a client. And, uh, and it did not go very well. On the public front, uh, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, the one thing that didn't come up in our conversations and preparing for this, so I'm sorry for any surprises, the largest companies, the largest public companies, while the chance of audit for most taxpayers is very small, the largest companies are constantly under audit. Uh, once, they're, once a company is in the system, they seem to get audited very regularly. For some large companies, the IRS is basically parked there. They have an office there and they're auditing companies constantly. Uh, and companies will take aggressive positions. I worked in financial services. There are a number, you know, there are ranges of risk that clients took over the decades. And, uh, and I would say that you know, the other side of that for these large companies comes down to how they accounted for it in managing their reserves for book purposes. And, you know, most clients seem to have adequate reserves. There was a lot of give and take with their auditors about that. I, I was part of that process for many of my clients. And, uh, you know, so it ended up just a cost of doing business, but one or two companies, uh, the tax director at the lead would say, we never want that Wall Street Journal risk. And I think that some of them may have sometimes been too conservative, given where uncertain positions ultimately played out. You know, there's a there's an opportunity loss in not taking a position that ultimately turns out to be OK when the government finally decides on. And, and just just as a follow up to that, um, what is the IRS attitude towards this? And is it something that they just consider uh, part of the normal business that they do or do they? Uh, take actions that would tend to discourage companies from taking these risks. So I feel obliged to put what we should have put at the beginning of this. Any views expressed are mine and not Baruch's. And, uh, and I certainly, I, I think Dan's probably better positioned to speak for how the IRS would view it. I know, I know at the end of the day, I, when I look at the, the sum of my career in client service and the interaction with, you know, both federal and state auditors, uh, there is a, a game to this that keeps, you know, maybe it's too complicated. And it's just a dance that keeps everybody employed because the fees generated for all of this are probably less than fully productive in terms of, you know, what the output is for it. But I, I don't know that there was more to it than that. You know, people are doing their jobs. They each come at it from the angle that they're coming at it, right? If I was representing a client, the obligation was to provide, you know, to to keep their tax as low as possible. That's what we were hired to do uh, within reason. And, uh, and the IRS's and you know, the auditor's view is, uh, how do we get as much money here as possible? It, it and, was, is the game inherently unfair since the people that are representing the IRS are agents making whatever they earn and the people defending the corporations are making seven figure money because they're high-class lawyers. Is that game unfair? Is, is, is the knowledge differential so great between the two? Well, you know, the IRS does have some very experienced and some very good people. I, I, you're right that the large bulk of the auditors are probably people just starting out in life and they're not, not that sophisticated. Uh, I think it is certainly true that the IRS 
does not have the manpower or the expertise to deal with the most complex questions. And, uh, and that means that people who are taking relatively aggressive positions on the complex questions are probably okay. Uh, you know, auditors uh, have to, you know, they, if I've heard recently people saying that they're avoiding partnership audits and uh, because those are really hard. So uh, I think uh, we do need a, a more aggressive, uh, better funded IRS. And Congress has been doing its best to prevent that. And that is really troubling. By the way, was that your problem when you were trying to write tax law in your years in government, Danny, that the Congress got in the way, politics got in the way? You mean, was Congress a, a, a force for fairness in the tax law? No, was they, were they a force for unfairness in the tax law? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I would call it unfairness, but I, I think equity was 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 not the uh, principal concern of the members of the Ways and Means and Finance Committees most of the time. Some of them were very good. Uh, some really cared. Uh, a lot of them didn't. And uh, you know, I think campaign contributions have a lot to do with what the what the tax law says. Uh, we we did a webinar on campaign contributions, uh, which rears its ugly head every time I look around the business system. Um, um, do me a favor, Matt or Rocky, can you put up the chart that I had, um, the PowerPoint that I had? I want to show it to you and see what you think. See, here's um, a Pete Peterson Foundation chart. It shows the share of uh, GDP that's represented by US uh, corporate income tax revenue among the G7. And you can see the highest one, let's say it's Japan at four and the lowest is the United States at one. And I'm wondering, is that accidental? Is that intentional? Um, is there some difference in the tax system that would account for that? This enormous difference where the Japanese in their corporate tax system raised 4% of GDP and we raised 1% of GDP, which will be a little well, higher this year. But Larry, do you happen to know what the history would be if you went back to 30 Yes, years? I do. Dan, great minds think alike. Do you have the second slide? See, here's corporate income tax revenue was a share of GDP <clears throat> dating back to 1934. And you can see over here, I don't know if you can see this, but in the, in the war years, it got up to something over 7%. And then it gradually slid and it's been sitting at 1% since roughly at the bottom in 1984, it got as high as 2.5% in 2009, now back to roughly 1%. That's the history. Yeah, I, I don't know, uh, you know, on the chart, the prior chart that you showed, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the relative tax, corporate tax rates in each of those countries, but some of this could be driven by the fact that you know, what we have in the United States right now is it, you know, there's a, a mix between worldwide versus territoriality in terms of how taxes are assessed. So for corporate taxes right now, if our, a global corporation headquartered in the U.S. with subsidiaries overseas will earn tax, will earn income in a foreign jurisdiction, pay taxes at the tax rate there. If that tax rate is lower than the U.S., even when they repatriate that money now under current law, they don't pay additional taxes. So the tax is paid where the income is earned. So you'd have to look for the, these largest U.S. corporations. What's the mix of where they're earning their income? Which I think gets to the heart of the... the uh, Do you think that could account for this difference of 4 and 1%? Or in I don't know. Canada, which is almost 4 well, there, you know, there are a couple of things that you can look to. Uh, one, our corporate rates, I think now, are pretty much the lowest in the world. Uh, they have been the highest in the world at times. But when we got cut to 21 percent, I think that may be the lowest or it's certainly close to the lowest. Second thing, I, I don't really know the answer to this, but we may have a greater share of our income in partnerships, uh, particularly now that we have private equity. Um, booming as much as it is, in which case uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't necessarily a showing of what the rate of tax on business is compared to the rest of the world. I'm just guessing about that. I don't really know. <laughs> uh, and then the next question would be, do we have more loopholes? And right now, 
uh, apparently we we pretty much allow corporations to deduct the cost of uh, capital the cost machinery and equipment when they buy it and i'm i don't know but i doubt if that's the position in the rest of the world as well well i just want to make clear to our audience and you can take down these slides now uh matt or rocky um but in in most of the rest of the world and, and when we started in the united states you depreciated capital equipment over the useful life. That's the way we learned it in school. Maybe there was an accelerated depreciation, but basically over the useful life. And now you can deduct it in one year. Uh, Pretty much. Right, but that's, there are some, there's a limit on that as a permanent provision and there are some temporary provisions uh, that go in part to what is the role of the tax system, right? If the tax system is just about raising revenue, then that's a bad fact. If the tax system is about encouraging certain behavior from taxpayers, you know, what was the reason for bonus depreciation, you know, and allowing extensions of bonus depreciation where you could immediately expense everything. A lot of that is driven by governmental desire to stimulate the economy at points when they want to do that. So let, let's move back to the system again. For, for 2021, there is some estimates around that the corporations paid 1.7 up from 1.1, whatever it was, of GDP in taxes, while individuals paid 9.1. In 1950, it was 3.7 for corporations and 5.7 for individuals. Is this the intent of government or is this the way it turned out? Was it the intent of government to have individuals pay far more than they used to and for corporations to pay far less? Is that intent? Well, I, you know, it's a complicated question, but I think there are people who believe that that the, we should not tax investment income at all; that we should only tax uh, basically income from labor, uh, and if and therefore anything that imposes a tax on corporations or other business it tends to reduce investment and reduce activity. Uh, and one of the things that I think we didn't do in 2017, when we reduced the corporate tax as much as we did, uh, I think that the, the assumption, we did not pay for it. I mean, that was a huge expenditure. Uh, we, we hear the Republicans talk about uh, deficit reduction, uh, didn't bother them when they were cutting tax rates. Uh, so there was no pay for, and a lot of people who were proposing a lower corporate rate were suggesting that the rate on shareholders should go up. Uh, the current system now is that if you have corporate income, uh, you pay the 21% rate. If you can get the step up in basis of death, or if you give the corporate stock away to charity, that's the only tax you pay. And in fact, for reasons that are hard to explain, if you reinvest the money in the corporation, the earnings on that reinvested earnings are taxed at 21% permanently, even if they are distributed to shareholders. Uh, and that is a tremendous tax reduction on, first of all, foreign shareholders, uh, nonprofits who own a considerable amount of corporate tax were paying 35% uh, on that income. Now they're paying 21% on that income. Uh, so that's a big deal to the universities and the pension funds. Maybe that's a good idea, but uh, other people might disagree with that. So uh, I think that uh, the, the real question is distribution. And I would view the corporate tax as playing a role in the distribution of the tax burden in the same way I would view the estate and gift tax as doing it. And if you're gonna reduce corporate rates, you should be raising rates on the high income people. So it is what we're doing, making permanent this division between rich and poor, because by and large, since um, earned income is being taxed at a relatively high rate and unearned income is being taxed at a relatively low rate, Seems to me the di division will only grow greater. Is that unfair? Well, it, there's two questions there. Do you, if you really believe that uh, only earned income should be taxed, you know, some of my colleagues who do believe in uh, allocation of earning, allocation of tax burden, would say what you need to do is raise the rate on wages. Uh, and I think that's just impractical. If you're going to suddenly say uh, we're not going to tax investment income and we're going to tax young lawyers or young doctors at 50% or more on their earnings. I don't think that goes anywhere in Congress. So in theory, you, the fact that you don't tax corporate income doesn't mean you have to change distribution of the tax burden, but I think in practice it does. Uh, can, I, can I say, I mean, you showed the slide, Larry, that showed 
you know, the small amount of GDP that is borne by the corporate tax system. Uh, you know, and it's fair to say, you know, in part, I, I would assume that a lot of business in the United States is done through small businesses, which are done primarily in partnership or S corporation form where there is no corporate tax. So I don't know if worrying about corporate taxes in terms of solving the fairness problem is is the right starting point because even if you doubled or tripled those taxes it would it would certainly make a dent right we know that the recent proposal to you know have this minimum tax on the largest corporations based on book income is supposedly going to raise about 300 billion dollars over 10 years it's not nothing but it doesn't really solve the gdp the gdp problem that you're that you show and you know that you highlight in that slide and it really does come down to if corporations or use of S corps or partnerships are just an engine for gathering capital and running the engine of business to allow for jobs and owners that you know to share in the wealth that they create then it comes back to the point that Dan made that the real inequity probably lies in things like the estate tax provisions or the step up in basis when you look at the amount of wealth that's about to be the amount of wealth that's about to be transferred, uh, you know, over the next few decades, uh, we're talking about three quarters of a trillion dollars that's going to pass with a complete step up in basis under the current system. And other than for the top, you know, the, the wealthiest individuals, based on current numbers, though those will those will drop, a relatively nominal estate tax. Just just for the purposes of our audience. Can we define what step up means so that our audience sure. understands it? So let's say that you put a hundred dollars into purchasing, you know, the stock of Zipline Corporation uh, on day that's, one. That's a bad investment. I can tell you. I, I, I'm betting not. But uh, if you put a hundred dollars into Zipline Corporation on day one, and on that day, you know, many many decades into the future, when the owner of Zicklin shares passes, the shares are worth $1,000 a share. Well, if you were to sell those shares, you would have a sale at 1,000, less basis of 100 for $900 of gain that would be subject to tax. But the way our current system works, when someone passes, uh, there is an increase in the basis of those shares from 100 to their fair market value of 1,000 in my example. So that if somebody turned around and then sold them after the after they received them as a beneficiary, they would pay zero tax on that on that sale, and it would only be a question of whether the estate owed estate tax based on the value of the property and the estate. So you, Michael, could get the, you could get the same benefit by giving those shares to charity. Agree. Oh, there there is a question that has come in through chat. Uh, is there any chance that the uh, that inflation might be taken into account in in levying that? the step up i mean a lot of that increase in your example the 900 might sit after decades might simply represent inflation well the tax the for a sale of property inflation is not a factor so that would be a benefit that is not available to the living if they were to sell those shares but i mean the the, the 900 dollar increase is um a lot of that is actually just uh, inflation and in, in prices. Uh, perhaps that's true, but my point is, if I'm 99 years old and I sell my shares, I pay tax on $900 in my example. If I die the next day and I give those to my children, there is no income tax on those same shares. Inflation, inflation could be uh, a problem, and I personally believe we should we can index the tax system for inflation. But it's not currently. Uh, but, indexed but we inflation. don't do it, and uh, so the argument that uh, this is just inflation, as Michael said, yeah, but if I sell it, it's just inflation, and in a lot of times, uh, if, if you you don't really get hurt by inflation, and you still get the benefit of capital gain rates and and other things that are there to mitigate the burden of uh, the tax on investment income. And also, Gwen, certain provisions of the code do have inflation adjustments every year when they when limits are set. Some of those limits increase every year. There is an inflation component to some of that, but okay. not on the not on the fact pattern we were talking about. Here. Michael, I want I want to go back to something you said when you talked about the fact that there isn't that much money to be raised if we change some of this. 
And I want to point to the differences between perception and reality. I agree with what you said, and I understand that to be the case. But there is a perception that the tax system is rigged because, um, as um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway pointed out once, uh, the CEO, I forget his name, now, Warren Buffett, is paying a, higher, uh, paying a lower tax rate than his secretary. So there is this perception that the tax system is rigged. And it's rigged because of what Dan mentioned a, a while back, when she talked about corporate giving and lobbying and all the rest. So I would argue the system where corporations pay less, um, individuals pay more, and the system is adjusted in such a way that the richest can give it away, give it to charity, use the step up, whatever, is a rigged system. Is that unfair? I think your target is the wrong target. Uh, if you think it's rigged, it's not rigged because Berkshire Hathaway is paying too little tax. It's rigged because, because Warren Buffett is paying. No, I'm not tax. Warren Buffett. I apologize. I'm no, not. no, but I, but I'm saying what you, the point you made is based on the fact that because our tax system is primarily transaction based, things have to happen, right? There have to be sales or exchanges of property to trigger the obligation to pay tax, or someone has to get paid something for a service or a good in order to generate tax. The problem that you're speaking to is the fact that the folks that have accumulated the greatest share of wealth can just sit on those shares, sit on that wealth, never generate a transaction and never pay a tax. It speaks to some of the things that, you know, Elizabeth Warren is speaking to when she proposes a wealth tax where, you know, perhaps you'd have to value your assets every year and pay some small percentage of that if you're at that highest range. That might address some of the inequity you're speaking of. I, I, the problem with that is I think there's an interesting legal issue in proposing a wealth tax because Congress under the constitution has the right to propose an income tax. And if you propose the tax on wealth, I would expect the first thing to happen is that there might be, and I don't know how it would come out, but I would expect that there'd be a constitutional challenge to it and it would end up in the Supreme Court at some point. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, the advantage is not only the step up in basis of death, but the fact that you don't pay tax at all until you sell something. And so you can look at the effective rate on Bezos is, I don't know, zero probably or 1% because he has not paid a tax on all that growth. And uh, even if you got the tax at death, it would still be relatively small. So you need to tax it annually. And uh, you can do that by a wealth tax, or you could do that by an income tax, uh, which tax gains annually. And, you know, they Biden did talk about it, at least for very rich people, but, and I think it's actually in the budget, but it didn't get any play publicly at all. Uh, Alternatively, you'd need Congress to change. You know, there isn't much to define what gross income really is for purposes of the tax code, but all anybody teaching it or practicing it would agree that it is generally transaction based. There are some exceptions. You know, there are bonds where you recognize interest income every year, you know, even though, you know, they don't pay out every year. Like, but, but, but when we have a system, and I'm, I'm pointing now to a White House study that said between 2010 and 2018, the 400 richest families in the United States paid an average income tax rate federal of 8.2%. Middle income people and poor and that's people. All, that's really overstated because it doesn't count the unrealized gains as income. <laughs> oh, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So they pay a lot less than the 8.2%. Of their, of their increase in wealth. Right. Okay. This is only the, the transactional based wealth. Right. Um, and how many of those people are, I'm going to just target an industry, are either in asset management or in the real estate business? You know, I, where you get, you know, lots of opportunities to avoid taxable income in the real estate. Space. Well, I, I don't know the answer, but real estate is certainly one. And my guess is technology, where you don't recognize gains anywhere along the, the Jeff Bezos example right. is a perfect example. If he doesn't sell stock and, and he doesn't pay a dividend, if that were true, then he has no income. And yet his wealth goes into to the billions, the yeah. tens of billions, hundreds of billions. Um, well, that's that's the issue that I spoke to earlier, that there's no transaction to cause a realization event for him. And you'd have to change the definition of gross income for that increase in wealth to constitute income. 
just paper paper wealth constituting income. So let me move a little bit away from this. If the system, and this is my words, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I happen to believe the system is not fair, whatever that means. If the system is not fair and we have to find a solution, is a consumption tax one of the solutions? Well, we're, you mean like a VAT? Like a VAT. Or and a national talk, sales tax. Let's, let's talk about what a VAT is so everybody understands. It'll what be a value-added tax where as manufacturers are, are increasing the value of goods as they put them together, there's a tax imputed every step of the way. It, it, it's, it's easier to, for this conversation to think about it in the context of a national sales tax. But and and think, by the way, we have a VAT now. It's just called state and local sales well, that's tax. What sta that's what state and local governments do, and, and that, that's fine. So, the, so that is not foreign to us. Uh, well, a national sales tax is foreign to us. Yes, I agree. Uh, but local, we, we, we accept it. So the problem with consumption-based taxes is uh, they are seen as potentially regressive, right? Because you still have the problem that we just spoke about with respect to the increase in unrealized gains, the wealthy do not spend most of their income, right? They, the folks at the lower end of the economic spectrum will spend a higher portion of their income and therefore will be the ones that bear the, the highest burden of that tax. You could certainly put a refund mechanism in place, I guess, in the tax code for people that you know, are, less, are lower than a certain income level but the problem with that is you would still be subject, you know, sales taxes in the US are, are charged at the point of sale. So people would still need the money for that at the time of sale. So I think overall, if it's implementable at all, it would be seen as regressive, uh, which would not have a lot of popularity with the people you're trying to help here. Uh, the other problem that I think, you know, history has shown is that in every country, that has instituted a VAT tax, the party that introduced it was voted out the following election. I think that's I think that's a true statement. And I, I, I if I'm off, I'm off by one country. But, but wait a second. I, I think I think what Larry, I think what you're suggesting by your question is you look at somebody like Jeff Bezos or or Zuckerberg, they obviously spend a lot more money than their income that they report to IRS. And, and the question would be, can we focus a tax on, ex, on consumption at the high end and avoid a lot of the problems that Michael was just talking about? Uh, I, I, think it's, I don't think it's been taken seriously in this country, but what you're suggesting is that maybe we should because we're, if we're not likely to get their income, we should at least tax their consumption. That's fair. And there, there was a proposal by somebody who used to sit next to me at, uh, at Cornell um, um, who said, what we ought to do is take you know, everybody's income, uh, subtract their savings, and whatever else should get taxed as a consumption tax. So if you buy a yacht, you should pay more than state and local taxes. You should pay a federal tax on that yacht. And by the way, what people are doing now, and we just saw it in one of the major corporations in Peloton, where when the stock is up and they need money, instead of selling stock, they just pledge the stock as collateral and borrow it. So they're still not paying taxes on consumption. Um, and they're just paying interest, right. which is tax deductible. Right. Which is the same thing that happens in the real estate industry. In the real estate world. Out. In the real estate world, it's worse because you can sell a building and buy another building and yeah. not pay taxes and just change the tax basis. Um, one of the ways corporations get away with a lot of this lower tax rates is they place intellectual property in strange places with low tax rates. Um, I, I just want to give you a statistic that I picked up. Uh, American corporations reported to, in 2019 that they earned 60 billion in the Cayman Islands in 2019, 60 billion in the Caymans. The GDP of the Caymans is 6 billion, but American corporations earn 60 billion there. Thanks. So they earn 10 times the GDP of the country. I mean, isn't that 
outrageous on its face? What more do you have to know? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so depending on what the make of that's, I, I can't imagine there are large uh, manufacturing operations that are driving that. There were probably two numbers. people in a rented right. office in the Caymans. That's yeah. The trademark, so, the trademark and the patent is, is owned by a Cayman corporation. <laughs> that's so the there, there is, so there is, you know, it does go to your original premise if, you know, if if folks are crossing the line, you know, then then what are the factors that drive that, right? One of the things is I, I would question how much of that 60 billion is substantively earned in the Caymans, right? Under under current law. And is that a target for audit, whether it's transfer pricing, whether it's do you really have boots on the ground in that country so that you have the right to to tr trace that income to that country? Uh, I would imagine that there's an opportunity for the IRS in some of that number. I, I think I think that's certainly true, and I'm I'm not a foreign tax person, so I won't be an, claim to be an expert on that. But there has to be some game playing there, which more aggressive audits could deal with. Uh, but I think it is certainly true, as you're suggesting. The, one of the main reasons for the low corporate tax payments that are indicated in the announcement for this webinar is the fact that people can are doing this and whether that's legitimate or not some of it certainly is and uh, the question is can we do anything about it can we prevent them from lowering their tax burden by allocating the and, income to these low tax jurisdictions and again if some of that is attributable to uh, if it's if it's coming out of if it's leakage out of the united states if some of that is attributable to legitimate borrowing that's structured through the Caymans to accommodate other investors worldwide. I, I'm getting into the weeds there, so I don't want to go too far off track, but there can be legitimate reasons to use a what we'll call a tax haven country on income that, depending on the nature of the investors above that, might not be taxable in the United States. So I don't want to say that all of it is bad and wrong. It, it does raise the eyebrows a little bit and warrant a little bit of a further, you know, of a closer look. How do we expect a middle-class taxpayer to look at numbers like these and make a judgment that I should do everything I can to avoid taxes because look what's going on across the street. And when you read about the Caymans, or you read about the uh, tax havens in Bermuda or um, Ireland or I guess Ireland is not a tax haven anymore, uh, or Caymans, obviously. Why should the normal taxpayer not just simply say, forget it, I'm not doing it. I will find all kinds of ways. I'll work under the table. I don't want to be paid. Just hand me cash. Well, it's, it's the fear factor, right? That That is the nature of a voluntary, you know, we have a voluntary compliance system uh, where we're taxed. But, but the reality is for most of us, a lot of the information is in the government's hands, and the exception is, as you as you said, the underground economy. And the risk there is, if you get caught, that's that's a big problem. And so every so often, someone gets caught, and they make an example of them in the press. The IRS. Uh, I'm always amazed that you know the timing of some of the big stories around tax avoidance cases that come up for individuals right around April 15th, maybe a month before, just to make sure that everybody knows they're still out there. Well, you know, I, th I think the bigger problem, I think research suggests that people look at these kinds of things and do feel that they should pay less tax on the, by themselves. As Michael just said, if you're a wage holder or if you're an investor in stocks, uh, you really can't do that because it's all reported to the IRS. But uh, small business, I think, is notorious for not paying what they're supposed to be paying. Uh, so there, there is certainly that problem. Uh, I think, you know, as we, the OECD is, did come to the conclusion that the only way you can solve this problem is by a worldwide minimum so that you, wherever you allocate the income, there's going to be a 15% tax rate on it. Uh, if you had asked me if that could work, I would have I've said, I don't know anything about foreign taxes, but that seems impossible. Last year, everybody was optimistic that it was going to happen. Uh, right now, it seems to be nobody is optimistic that it's going to happen. So... 
Uh, I don't know where that's going, but they, they certainly believe that that's a problem. I heard a number of years ago that the UK tax authorities, above the tax authorities, the finance minister, et cetera, noticed that Starbucks was not paying any tax in, or paying very little tax in the UK and they were selling a lot of coffee. Uh, and what was the answer? The answer was that the Starbucks uh, trademark was owned by a corporation in another jurisdiction and they were paying high royalties to the owner of the trademark. Now, that probably was abusive. You would think that the people selling the coffee are making significant amount of money from that. But uh, the, the minimum, minimum tax worldwide seems to be the least the most efficient way of dealing with that. Uh, I'm skeptical, but perhaps miracles can happen. Well, again, I, I think we have to be careful about blanket statements that something's abusive, right? I, I think that somebody opening a Starbucks in the UK probably has an automatic larger customer base than Meisler Roasters opening up in the UK. Um, so there is value to that name and where it's held. And so you pay a license fee and then it gets into, is it reasonable? Is it unreasonable for somebody to structure that efficiently? Again, as somebody who lived on that side of things for many years, it's hard for me to say that's not appropriate. If you think about it, for every Starbucks that sets up its trademark before it has the value that it has in a jurisdiction, or you know, in the licensing arrangements for that before it pops to the value that you know that you might be thinking about today, there are probably a hundred businesses that you know do some of that and fail. Yeah, but but going back to Danny's example of, of Starbucks for a minute. Since hundreds of Starbucks open up in England or are opened in England, I am assuming that they earn money. Otherwise, why would they open them? Agreed. But if they don't pay taxes, the implication is they don't earn money and they're opening them for fun. That can't be right. Well, well, the question is how do you allocate the money? Is no, I understand how to get around it. Are they earning money because they got a good trademark or are they earning money because they're selling coffee at a profit and uh that's that could still be arguable yeah but dan if they're not making money why are they opening these stores well they if are they making money but the, it's the trademark owner that's making the so, money so the, the same so, as the starbucks corporation in a different venue yeah. the real issue the real issue comes down to again I, I said the things that are black and white are clear you know right or wrong the issue here is how much should you be allowed to allocate to that name versus, you know, the flow of traffic into the real estate, uh, you know, the bricks and the bricks and mortar in the UK, in your example. And so that comes down to the art of transfer pricing, right? What's the real value of one thing versus the other? And is are those the battlegrounds, right? Where the IRS versus taxpayers at, in the jurisdiction that's impacted the most has to come in and bring in its transfer pricing experts and figure out how much income should actually be allocated to the UK in your example. Or you, or you could change the rules and say income is allocated to where you sell it, and then you wouldn't get into that question. And uh, that that is a proposal you see out there. Uh, but one of the problems with that is it allocates income to the rich countries with where the consumers are, and, and that might be a problem compared to the places that have the raw materials. And now, can, can at least legitimately claim a fair share of profits. Well, except if the capitalist system really works, the folks that have the raw materials will sell it at a market price. Let me ask, let me just ask you this. If each of you had your way, and if you accepted the fact, and I'm not asking you to accept it, except hypothetically, if you accept the fact that it may not be fair, what would you do to correct it? Okay. I, I would, if I gave I you all the power, I would raise the corporate tax rate from the 21% that's at right now. Uh, I think, you know, if 35% was too high, 21%, I believe is probably too low. Uh, so I'd start there. But then I would look at a couple of things on the individual side. Uh, first, wouldn't raise a lot of money, but if you talk about optics and fairness, um, I would probably look at, you know, look again at carried interest legislation and taxing carried interest. Just again, this is for asset managers. Uh, their share of the gains on the funds they manage is taxed at long-term capital gain rates, which are a maximum of 20%. And if you if you meet all the rules to do that, that is far lower than the 37% than the accountants and lawyers that advise them have to pay on their income 
for going to work every day the same way, you know, for anybody uninitiated to that. There have been several proposals to increase those taxes on that stream of income to ordinary rates. It doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't raise a lot of money, but I think optically it's it's another one of those things that from a political standpoint seems fairer than the system we see now. And uh, I've heard the arguments from, I, I've worked with you know the asset management industry and I know the arguments against that. I think they ring a little hollow. People will enter that business for the raw dollars involved regardless of the tax rate. Uh, the other thing I'd look at is we, Dan and I have both hit on it, uh, the estate tax issue of getting the step up in basis and then you know having a relatively high limit on what you can pass out of the estates you know over 12 over 12 and a quarter million per person nearly 25 about 25 million a couple uh tax free out of your estate uh you know and getting a step up in basis to get there means the entire estate if you never sell it moves to your heirs tax free with the amount of generational wealth we're seeing, we're about to see transferred, I think that's a huge source of, of potential revenue. I'd start there and I'll stop there and see if Dan has any. And, and by the way, it also slows down economic activity because people don't sell things because they know they can pass it on tax free. Dan, I'm exactly sorry. right. I, I agree with all those proposals. Uh, I, I would also at least look at trying to tax unrealized gains on at least high income people if we don't want to do it generally. And in terms of the corporate rate, one of the things that's true, and we have we had a used to have a low corporate rate on the first fifty thousand or hundred thousand dollars of income, that did not apply to passive income, and it did not apply to income from services. Uh, the current twenty one percent rate applies to all of that, uh, and, and I think that's a mistake. We should we should have the individual rates on passive income and income from services, and I think I would wor worry increase the possibility that uh, shareholder cannot avoid taxes on on the fact that either by dying or giving money to charity uh, and that those gains should be taxed even 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 if you don't uh, get a general step up in basis of repeal see and I, I wouldn't agree with that one on if you give it to charity because if you tax the income you would get a deduction for the oh you're talking about the the fair value deduction for contributions to charity while you're alive. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry. I withdraw that. I, I agree. I, with can, that. I can see a lot of not for profits that would not be happy with your solutions to this. They problem. would not be happy with that one. Nope. And one of the not for profits is Baruch College, I might add. They would not be happy with that one. They weren't happy when there were proposals to reduce the uh the deductibility of charitable contributions compared to you know, ta high taxpayers' marginal tax rates. So that, that goes back to the original point of what is the point of the tax system? If you want to encourage charitable giving, then that's a very powerful tool to allow it. So I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's where I'd start. I, 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 you know, it's not only the hedge fund, when we, we had a proposal that the minimum tax that we used to have applied to the, the unrealized gain on gifts to charity and the uh, presidents of Harvard and Yale universities went into Congress and said that was going to be the end of the charitable sector as 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 it exists yeah. today. So it's not just the hedge fund managers who take those positions. I thought that was really embarrassing. <laughs> I just want to add one more thing. This, Michael, you weren't alive, but Dan and I were alive when the individual maximum tax fund, uh, rate was 91%. Yeah. And just to go back to something you said, I never saw and I never met an entrepreneur who had a good idea for a business who said it to himself or herself, I think the individual tax rate is too high. I'm not going to create this new gizmo widget thing. That's right. Create. You know, we That's had, right. when the rate was reduced to 70%, the interior department said, well, you should leave the oil industry alone. Look what happened to them by just reducing the top rate from 91 to 70, because at 91%, you you could get a hundred most of the cost of drilling a well deductible it cost you practically nothing so they they thought that was really helping the oil industry to have the ninety one percent top rate. Lynn, you look like you have some questions. Well, there there are quite a few questions. Um, some of them are are quite detailed, but several of them have come in asking about international taxation issues. Um, one person asked if. Um, the, the possibility of the OECD worldwide minimum tax might make some corporations uh, less aggressive in trying to reduce their U.S. tax. 
Um, another asks if how that's going to affect um, trying to shift revenues to offshore. Um, kind of in general, uh, what would a global corporate tax look like and would it be feasible to do it all? Well, maybe I, it'll be very brief. So I, I, would, I would say as long as there is a differential to be achieved, then tax departments will be driven to try to take advantage of that of that arbitrage because you know there are there if you're a public company if you reduce you know your i don't know if you if you reduce your tax expense by 10 cents a share uh you know however you do it and the stock is trading at a multiple of 10 then you know if your price earnings ratio just changed by a dime and maybe that has an impact of a dollar a share so depending on you know now just add as many zeros or or cents to that as you'd like to but there will always be if there's if there's a differential someone will be tasked with taking advantage of that differential any other comments on that no i think that's a very good question and to be honest i do not know the answer <laughs> i given the time we'll probably leave it at that uh, one last question came in, and um, they referred to uh, our session description. And in our session description, uh, one of the questions was whether well, tax law should be modified to make it clear that the spirit of the law is relevant and often determinative. You know, what exactly was meant by that statement? Well, I, I think I, I did try to talk about that earlier. I think we should... Uh, look less to the letter of the law, less to the words of the law, and try to look at the background, uh, how that fits in with other parts of the code, uh, what the legislative history says, what it's likely that Congress is intended to do, and taxpayers should have an obligation in, in determining a reasonable basis for their position to look at those things more than they look at the words. That, that's what I mean by that. And I think that would have an impact, at least on people taking aggressive positions. I mean, we spent a lot of time in our pre-call for this uh, for this session uh, that went to the point that, you know, I, I challenged the premise of this of this webinar in that I don't think the burden is on the corporate taxpayer. I think the burden, if there's a failing here, it's really on Congress uh, to, you know, the rates are set too low, the loopholes are in there that allow this. They know about them in some cases, and it's just a matter of having the political will to fix them. Uh, and we could do another hour on the lobbyist effort to preserve some of these things. So well, I, I think, think I think apart from that, there are things there that are not supposed to be there that taxpayers claim are there. And as I tried to suggest earlier, to to to, to demand that the people who are drafting the law don't make those kinds of mistakes is asking the impossible. Okay. And, then, and again, we there are in some of these cases there are anti-abuse provisions. So the IRS and the courts do have some tools to continue to attack that. Yep. We are unfortunately out of time. Um, I want to thank you all. It's been a very engaging conversation. I want to mention to our audience that our next webinar will be November eighth. Uh, it deals with Major League Baseball. Is baseball on the decline? How can we save our national pastime? Uh, Larry's guest will be Professor Mark Edelman from our law department, who specializes in sports law. And we are working on, on getting a second, uh, an additional guest. Um, but for this discussion, I want to thank you, Larry. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Michael, for a very engaging discussion on a very, very complex issue of taxation. Thank you all. And thank thank you. you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Pleasure.